Hi there, it's Michael Lewis here. You probably know that Against the Rules is the first podcast that I've ever done, and it probably shows. So I appreciate all of you for sticking with it. The first season's over, but we want to give you something a little extra as a token of appreciation. The writer Malcolm Gladwell and I had a conversation back in April of 2019 when Against the Rules had just launched. We met in front of a live audience at the 92nd Street Y, which is this great center of culture and Jewish life on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. We had a big crowd, and the whole thing was a lot of fun to do. Uh, And we talked about how I got interested in not just podcasting, but the quandary of referees in American life. We want to give you a little peek behind the curtain of producing this show, and also a glimpse of the next season of Malcolm's podcast, Revisionist History. Thank you. Thank you, Malcolm, for doing this. Thank you. I, uh, my apologies to the audience. I'm the reason this is late. I was on the subway. Yep. Um, that, I feel like no further explanation is needed. Um, <laughs> Michael, I feel like every time you do some new project, you trot me out to interview you. and I feel like this is like my fourth time doing this. But I've done it as much for you as you've done it for me. Um, And I'm going to have to do it in September, apparently. Yeah, you might have to do it in September. Last time we were on the stage, I I feel I mortally offended you. And I got all kinds of angry, not angry, but kind of several friends of mine who might actually be here tonight, sent me emails saying, chiding me for my, I didn't let it, I, I, you know, I pursued particular lines of uncomfortable inquiry with too much vigor. So I'm going to be very not, I'm going to be nice this evening. (laughs) The nasty Malcolm has been put aside, and we're, we're just going to get nice, Malcolm. Um, let's talk about... Uh, just for the record, yeah. I don't remember any of that. Well, you... But, but that's... That, that, is, that is... I your, really don't remember any of that. That is your it's great charm. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. That is your great charm you, and genius. I in, do think that you have an ability to s- sell the most unbelievable bullshit, and, <laughs> and, and, no. and, and, and you, that you did, it, you did it with me the last time, and I don't want to suggest I was offended in any way, but... Jesus you Christ, were, Malcolm! What do you think you're doing? What? No, no, you're just you're this just proving to the world what a what a fantastic wasp you are. That you. And by the way, you're probably the only wasp in this room. Uh, the your ability to kind of like not see and dismiss and explain away conflict is quite extraordinary. But, um, <laughs> let's get back. I've spent on. much of my life as the only wasp in the room. Yeah, in fact. You're, it'll be on your. It'll be your tombstone. Toy Goy. He was I'm the a, only wasp I'm, in every room. I wrote. I wrote this piece for the New Republic called Toy Goy, and it was about being the Toy Goy, about being the one Goy in every in- Jewish institution. Yeah. It made everybody feel comfortable. Yeah. Uh, n- nobody cared what I thought about Israel. Uh, <laughs> I could. I could work on Passover. Uh, <laughs> you know, they, I played that role. Yeah. But uh, all right. So, what do you want to talk about? <clears throat> um, well, this wonderful podcast of yours. Um, and I wanted to start with obvious questions that you're going to get every time you do any kind of media. They're going to ask you this question. So I thought I'd start with it. Um, this transition from writer to podcaster, how was it? Well, you persuaded me this was a lot easier than it was. It, yeah. You really did. Which is a lie. It was a total lie. <laughs> yeah. so, the, so the short answer is, is it was a lot harder than I imagined it to be, but a lot more fun than I imagined it to be. Yeah. And it was different. And it was the, I came to the conclusion that some stories are better told in this medium than in a book form, for me anyway. Um, I mean, you have this great gift of being, I've said this to you many times, you have this great gift of taking ideas and giving them the qualities of actions. That you, you don't actually even need a character. All you need is your ideas to play with on the page, and the people become almost incidental. Uh, and I'm not sure it's a compliment, but go on. I, I'm not sure I meant it as a compliment. <laughs> but, but no, I, but, but it's, it, and it's uh, you create the feeling of narrative, even without the conventional ingredients of a narrative. Uh, I can't do that. Um, when I write what is essentially essay-ish material, it, it reads like an essay. If I don't have a main character, if I don't have a, like, a kind of drama that I'm playing out. And this, this idea was naturally kind of essay-ish. Uh, it was a series of it's 70 pieces around a theme. And it, as a book, 
it, it, I don't think it would have cohered. But so one of the cool things I found was this, the voice pulls, your voice is able to pull an audience through a story, even if there's not exactly a story. Even if it's even if it's not as the material is not as unified as you would like it to be if it was on the page, um, I found it's it's just it's interesting when they all of a sudden you can hear the characters' voices. Mm -hmm. You know, when you put something in quotation marks, no matter what you do around it, making that getting that sound off the page, you can't completely reproduce it. And we have characters who just come to life; their voices just just bring the. You don't have to do any work at all, um, and so that was interesting to me. Uh, are you saying, by the way, to go back, to, I want you to dwell a little bit on that idea that there are certain ideas, certain stories you, that you can only tell this way in a podcast. What did you mean? So maybe that? should I just first just explain what the podcast is because it just yeah. came out yesterday, the first episode. Uh, so it's called Against the Rules, and it's about referees in American life. Um, and it it's... The general argument is that the human referee is on the run or under assault wherever you, wherever you turn, except in the cases where the ref's been bought by one side, and then he might be very com comfortably ensconced in a rigged system. But um, the, the, there wasn't, for me, there wasn't one story I wanted to tell. There were a whole bunch of stories I wanted to tell. And they would have felt in a, in a book like either like a separate story or a digression, a long digression, I think. Um, and I, I wanted to play with the argument and I wanted to play with the subject matter, but I, did, I didn't have one person or I didn't have, <laughs> you know, normally what I have is either, either uh, I, have, I, have, I have a main character who can teach the audience. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, I had uh, seven or eight characters here and it, that would have been, it would have been hard to structure as a conventional narrative. So it was interesting to be able to do it this way. <clears throat> the other big difference um, is book writing is really an individual sport. I mean, it is just, it's just you. Uh, and uh, the, this is definitely, a, I don't know how you found it, but for me, it was completely a team sport. It was, and it was fabulous. I mean, the, the editor, the people who, the, Nick Bertel, who made the music, uh, the producers, the, you know, they, they were all intimately involved in, to the extent that in a couple of cases, the producers went and did a couple of the interviews. Uh, and that was having to, having to both make work with other people was, was I think, healthy for me, but also having to, because I don't often have to do it, um, but having to satisfy them in the course of doing that was interesting. Normally, I'm just satisfying me. Uh, and they were hard to satisfy. You Did know, you? they were hard to please. Uh, and that was, in, that was just, it was interesting to have that friction in my life. Did you feel like pleasing them entailed compromises? No. No. Le entailed me learning what the hell I was doing. I mean, that, they, I really, that they were right and I was wrong. What, most we, what of the time. kinds of things were you wrong about? Well, did my argument make sense to them? Yeah. That that's a simple one. But, but it was, much of it was just structural. It was kind of like, like what I, whether the, it, it was, it was just they had a better sense than I did. I learned pretty quickly, but they had a better sense than, what, than I did about what someone who was just taking it in here would tolerate from me in the way of, uh, a way of digression, in the way of uh, odd structure to story, in the way of starting something and not coming back to it for 15 minutes, what I had to do to accommodate, to make sure that I didn't lose the audience. Um, they also had a much better sense of what I could leave on the cutting room floor. That I, I all my scripts, and it was, it was more like, it was less like writing a book than writing a screenplay, which I've done. It was kind of in between. Um, all the all the original scripts were twice as long as they needed to be. And they were, there was all stuff that I didn't see you could remove and they saw, they were really good at seeing which you could pull out. So this, that was different, just having a, that kind of collaboration. Um, but the, you know, I, this, I, 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 when I'm moving through the world looking for things I'm going to do, uh, you know, th something will catch my eye and I'll open a folder on it. And not knowing where it will go. And I have stacks of manila folders beside, and shelves beside my desk. And a decade ago, two things happened that sort of triggered this interest in referees. And I never knew what I was going to do with it. And the folder got thicker and thicker, but it never emerged as a narrative. And then this medium comes along, and I, all of a sudden I could 
Oh, I had no idea. This was something a long time in the... Do you remember what the initial trigger was for the interest in referees? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The two things. Uh, it was right after the financial crisis. And um, I was... Uh, I'd just been put in charge of the Albany Berkeley Girls Softball League uh, travel ball teams. And my job was to take these little girls from Berkeley, uh, the all-stars from the league, at age 8, 10, 12, and 14, and, and get them into shape so they could go over the hill and, and compete against Republicans. And, uh, <laughs> and my predecessor had not done a very good job of it. Yeah. And I, went to, I took it seriously. And so my, the, my girls were playing. And the first time I start, I, when I opened the file, it, it, it started with this. It was our first tournament. It was in a little place called Ronert Park. And it was, a, it was a night game, and there were a bunch of nine-year-old girls on the field and maybe 50 parents in the stands. Um, and it was close. And one of our girls slid into home plate uh, to tie the game the top of the last inning. And the Ronert Park, the opposing team's coach, came out of the dugout and started, started cursing up and down at the umpire who called our little girl safe. I mean, the language was just unbelievable. And their whole fan side started screaming at the umpire. And our, you know, no one on our side, none of the little girls in our dugout had ever heard the word fuck. And they were, just, they were in awe. They were watching this. They'd never seen, a, I, I kind of loved it because it was great. I loved that they could see how grownups actually behaved instead of how, <laughs> instead of how Berkeley parents actually <coughs> behaved. But, but this thing escalated on the field. And the coach didn't back down and the umpire didn't back down. The umpire was a woman. Uh, and all of a sudden, the Berkeley parents started getting raged. And so you looked around and, Everybody's screaming at everybody, and most of the people are screaming at the umpire. Um, there was a great Berkeley moment when this voice cut through the night, and, it, and she, I, she, this woman screamed, what horrible modeling for our children. But beyond, <laughs> but except for that, it was like, you idiot, you asshole, you, you know, you're yeah. safe, out. You know? and, and the umpire, finally, the coach finally threw the coach out, so you're out. But it was his ballpark. So he says, okay, you can throw me on. He steps outside. He says, I, I'm now no longer in the position of coach. I'm now in the position of director of this facility, and you're fired. <laughs> so so he, he, it's now 9 o'clock at night, and the malls are up in the, in the lights, and everybody's jaws on the floor. The, 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 they just fired the only umpire, so the game can't actually go on. And she doesn't know what to do. She's actually just... Cause, okay, and, and just walks out into the parking lot. Everybody's just standing on the field. And I thought this was my moment when I'm in a position of authority. What, what am I, I sort of followed, followed her out into the parking lot. And she was weeping. Uh, and uh, I went up to her and I kind of like put my arm around her. This is before me too, you know? And, and it was okay to kind of console in a Biden-like manner. And, uh, uh, and, and I said, you know, no, no. I said, you know, you know, you don't, you don't have to take that. You know, you really should go back. And I said, it was like, is there anybody you can call? And she says, yeah, there's an umpire association. And it was, it was nine o'clock in California. It was unbelievable there was anybody where this place was. She gets the umpire association on the line and they say, he can't fire you. We're going to call the guy who's the head of the thing that is the head of the facility and we'll get him fired. You go back and finish umpiring. And she went right back in and threw him out and, and the game went on. But from then on, I started to watch these poor people who were, who were brought out to umpire nine-year-old girls' games. And they were on the, on the receiving end of constant abuse. And, and my first question was, why would anybody even do that job? But my second reaction was, why, <coughs> why do people behave that way towards umpires? I've never felt that way towards umpires. Why do, they, why do people take out so much of their fury on them? Why is that so hard, that job? Mm -hmm. So this happens it, 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 as I finish the big short and I'm, and I'm watching what's going on on Wall Street in the, in the back end of the financial crisis. And one way of looking at the financial crisis was as an umpiring problem, that refereeing problem. Uh, there, there was a breakdown of several refereeing roles, but the, one of the big ones was the credit rating agencies, Moody's and Standard & Poor, explicitly tasked with refereeing uh, the, secu the, the securities that Wall Street brings to market. Now, totally failed. They totally failed for a very good, simple reason. 
they were being paid by the people who created the subprime mortgage bonds they were rating. They were on the take. Uh, they were being paid, it was like being played by one of the players. And this umpire uh, briefly was flayed in public, but basically was allowed to go right back to doing what they were doing without any reform whatsoever. And so I had this umpiring file with two umpires, two kinds of umpires. One was a, uh, a very nice woman with some spine who was just trying to do her best uh, and make sure the game was paid, played fairly. And she was being made miserable. And the other were these umpires on Wall Street who who were doing their job in a kind of, who had horrible incentives and, and, and were not, um, they were not agents of fairness. And the society was enabling them to keep going even though they'd orchestrated, helped to orchestrate this horrible calamity. And I, I just started at that point, started to think, you know, like why do some umpires, why are some umpires in positions of strength and why are some umpires in position of weakness? First thought what I was going to do is write a sitcom about umpires. It just set in the world of girls softball. But I, I really had no idea what I was going to do with the material. Yeah. Uh, and I, I just started to accumulate material. And then Jacob Weisberg, your co-founder of Pushkin Industries, uh, and I are on the uh, hiking trail a year and a half ago. And we just started talking about this subject. And he said, you know, it could work as a podcast. And by the time we sort of, when you start thinking about the subject and start looking, when you start looking for referees, you see them everywhere. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the, there was, it ended up being seven episodes, but could have been 15. Uh, and there was a kind of, like, like there were some arguments to be teased out, but you had to move <coughs> around in a somewhat haphazard fashion that the podcast structure really lets you do. Yeah. Can, and, I, can I ask you, I want to go back for a second, a, a, a kind of writerly question. In this file, after that experience with your daughter's baseball team, how much did you like write a big, how much did you write about the, that evening? I wrote a paragraph about the evening. Oh, that's stu it. Stuck it in the file and I put on the outside of it um, umps and, uh, and chased it. And I made notes to, like I would check at the tournament, uh, the girls' tournaments, I would follow the umpire back to his car. They, a lot of these guys live out of their cars and just talk to them a little bit about why they did what they did. Um, the, and I, 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 so I'd make notes based on those conversations. And I just, I was just kind of, I just kind of, sometimes I open one of these files and nothing goes in it. It's just umps stick it up on the shelf. Maybe that's a subject I will pursue. But it just seems to me, I mean, the, you, and the more you watch it, if you back away from and look at the way this society treats people, it just in, in sports, in the umpiring role, it's bizarre. You know, you go to a basketball arena and 18,000 people are chanting in unison, ref, you suck. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the but there aren't 18,000 people on the other side who are saying, thank you for making the calls on my, uh, in our favor. I mean, it's like nobody's, nobody's ever thanking this person for the cheating he's supposedly doing on behalf of the other team, of the other, and pe the people see in this person, uh, injustice where it doesn't exist. This person has this ability to generate an outrage that's out of all proportion to, uh, to like how he's behaving. And um, <coughs> it's sort of like he, he ends up, um, he ends up at the center of, uh, I mean, he ends up as a character generally kind of unexplored. I, you know, one of the things that ended up on the cutting room floor I interviewed Daryl Morey, who was the, the uh, Houston Rockets GM, who I adore, who had lots of, done lots of studies about umpire, about referees, knew their tendencies, knew like where home court advantage was worse because the referees are better because referees are more likely to give the, 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 the home team the call, had done all this work on referees. And I asked him, have you ever met him? You ever met one of them? He's, no. You know, it never even occurred to me that I should actually go meet one of these guys and talk to one of these guys, mm -hmm. that they were completely unexplored characters. Uh, Why, you know, uh, it's interesting to go back to the paradigm you have between the Wall Street people and the baseball, Little League baseball umpires. In one case, the operating assumption is the, I can influence the ref if I uh, try and intimidate her, if I abuse her. In the other case, the notion is that I simply buy them off. In other words, I, I yes. do an exaggerated form of charming them. Yes. And I've always wondered why uh, those roles aren't reversed. So are there NBA coaches who try to charm referees? And are there 
businesses who, who, or business people who explicitly try and essentially scream at the government referee? So um, the answer to the first question is surprisingly few. Um, the NBA players, that, I, that you can't really get the players, even the former players won't talk about the refs because they just get in trouble. Um, but Shane Battier, who's a friend who played in the NBA for many years, said to me, it amazed him that no one ever, how, how seldom people tried to actually be nice to the refs. And that's what his strategy was, to be nice to the refs. We thought that was an original strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the, but the, 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 but, uh, but the answer, the answer in the NBA is one of the reasons everybody's really even angrier at the refs, even though the refs are getting better, is that the refs are getting better. They're hard, it's harder to charm and harder and impossible to intimidate. They're, they're holding themselves to these objective standards and they're judged by these objective standards and the stuff that's going on around them, they're more and more impervious to. Um, uh, the, so the second part is, are there... Do, is it worth browbeating? Yes. I feel like Mark Cuban was an example of somebody who tried to browbeat us. The SEC. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I think the browbeating works in private. Uh, but 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 what? It's so much better if you can just buy the ref. You know, I mean that if you if you look at uh, if you look at the way I mean the rating that that was that's such a sweet it, it, rather than go in and scream at Moody's and Standard and Poor that your subprime mortgage bonds are triple A so much better just to slip them some money to make you know to create that incentive so that they're more likely to smile upon the, the securities, but so anyway th th this whole thing come it, it it it's an interesting the, the subject got more interesting to me and it became more real in the presidential election because every, all because the the two campaigns that had a real energy about them was Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump's campaign and at bottom of both campaigns was the system's rigged that that that, 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 that it was all about uh, referees having not done their job uh, and there was some justice to those charges but that, that and that's why I thought you know maybe we could, maybe there's maybe this is worth trying to do and it was. We'll have more of my conversation with Malcolm Gladwell at the 92nd Street Y in New York after this break. It's spring. The time of year when seeds grow into flowers and you grow up, financially at least. Your family needs protection if something happens to you. And that means you need life insurance. Thankfully, Policy Genius makes it easy to get that financial security without the growing pains. Policy Genius is the easy way to buy life insurance online. In just two minutes, you can compare quotes from top insurers to find your best price. Once you apply, the Policy Genius team will handle all the paperwork and red tape. No commissions, no hidden fees, just financial protection and peace of mind, no strings attached. And Policy Genius doesn't just simplify life insurance. They also make it easy to compare and buy home insurance, auto insurance, and disability insurance. So next time you stop to smell the roses, pull out your phone and head to policygenius.com. Policy Genius, spring is here. Kick it off by nipping life insurance in the bud. We're now back with more of my conversation with Malcolm Gladwell. I wanted to compare notes with Malcolm, who's been podcasting for a while. If you listen closely, you'll hear a little bit about what's to come in the next season of his show, Revisionist History. When you, when you made those initial observations about umps, umpires, referees, um, did you think you were examining an age-old um, problem or a new problem? The thing that I loved about the first episode that came out yesterday was I kept on, I was thinking, oh, this is interesting and Michael's going to tell me why we've always had this problem. But then you told me, no, 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 no. This is new for really, really interesting reasons. And that was the turn where you cooked me in. And that that was a non-obvious turn. I feel like if I had done a story, I would have blown it because I would have just tried to prove to you to been around forever. And that's not interesting, actually. Well, that the, that the refs have been abused forever. Yeah, I would have said, oh, you know, what you're observing is something the Romans did. You know, I would have done that, some <laughs> ludicrous move like that. 
But the thing, I was genuinely so the, surprised by the turn where we learn it's new and why, why it's new. So sports is such a wonderful laboratory just because it's so clean in so many ways. But it's new and it's, in, it's, it's, it's new-ish in that the NBA, when Adam Silver became commissioner, mm-hmm. He, he, they, like, but back up to four. The first episode is about that, the refs. It's about an actual sports ref. The yeah, only episode yeah. in the in the series that's about sports is the first is the first episode, and it's about it professional basketball refs. Um, and what's it, what was interesting to me about that subject is if you, I mean, I think it's just just kind of generally true in sports combination of technology and an aware and, and transparency is forcing all the umpire and the refereeing to get better. Um, and you would think that would cause everybody to appreciate the refs more or at least protest them less. Uh, but that's not happening, um, especially not happening in basketball. It's got, from the point of view of the refs, it's getting worse and worse. It's sort of like more likely to need a bodyguard to the arena, uh, more likely to have really ugly things set in the stand, out of the stands, more likely to have to throw star players out of the game because of things they do and say. Um, at the same time, the, ref, the, re, the refereeing is clearly more objectively accurate. And the, the thing that, um, do you remember Kurt Schilling, the pitcher? Yeah. So this, there was a moment where it told you what, kind of why objective refereeing might end up creating a lot of anger in sports. Um, Major League Baseball introduced pitch track machines into uh, ball the ballparks. And that's the machine that shows you where the strike zone is. And up to the point they introduced these machines, the strike zone is entirely a subjective matter of what the umpire thinks is a strike. And there's no real way to check him. Now they have measured the strike zone. They can determine if the umpire has been after the fact, if the umpire has been calling accurately or not. And he, he's graded on his accuracy. He's measured against the machine. So there's been this in the decades since they've introduced those machines, there's been a pressure on these umpires to conform to the to the, to the, uh, the, the machine's accuracy. And the way, and, and they have, um, and they'll brag. I only got one wrong, you know, now why they even keep the umpires there is another question because the machine could just do it. Mm-hmm. But, but the umpires started to change the way they call the game in response to the machine meaning they became more accurate. You'd think everybody would think that was a good thing. Kurt Schilling came out of a ball game early when he was a pitcher. I can't remember who he was pitching for at the time. He wasn't the Red Sox. I think he might have been with the Diamondbacks. Furious because his perform- he had not performed well. Went into the dugout, grabbed a bat, and went and destroyed the pitch track machine. And they, they fined him $50,000. And he, and he was angry because the umpire used to give him calls that were not strikes. Uh, before they introduced this machine. And he no longer was given that privilege. He no longer had the advantages that are naturally accorded the stars. Um, And something like that is what's going on in basketball. And what's happened in basketball is they've tried to introduce a a similar spirit of objectivity. Um, And they've done it in many different ways. They have they built this five years ago for $15 million. They built this replay center in Secaucus, New Jersey, which is the, the site of the first episode of the podcast. $15 million to, to run direct fiber optic c- cables to, to every basket, NBA basketball arena. In the, each arena there, I don't know, a dozen cameras anyway, uh, trying to get every angle on the court. And this room in Secaucus is 110 television screens showing the, all the angles on every court in the NBA. And that's all it shows. And so you can't watch, you know, you can't watch Homeland on it. Uh, you, can't, you can't do anything with these TVs except watch whatever happens to walk onto that basketball court, wherever it is. And they're guys, they're professional referees in there every night during the season, double checking the calls of the actual refs on the floor. Uh, in case the refs make mistakes. And the refs themselves are now graded and they're shown their mistakes after the game. They have the opportunity to check their mistakes if they, if they, if they're not, they check their judgments and not sh- sure they're right. They're trained and evaluated in all kinds of ways they've never been before. Uh, they are, the hiring process is more professional. It's just like gotten, used to be an old boys network. Like half a dozen of the refs 
25 years ago came from the same high school. It was just a bunch of kind of chubby white guys, mainly Catholic. From Philly. Uh, from, Philly. from Philly. From Philly. That's yeah. right. And and now you've got, they broaden out the, they've broadened out the talent search. They got to get in shape. They used to be fat, right? You know, everybody else in America is getting fatter and the refs are getting better shape. Uh, now they're buff. And, they, and, and, and they're, tra- they're trained, they, they're being taught about all their biases, the kind of biases that Kahneman Tversky taught us about, but also, you know, that they're more likely to give the home team the call or they have racial <coughs> bias. And they're, taught, and they're taught to correct for all this stuff. How could they be anything but better? But getting better does not mean making, is not making people happy. Yeah. It's but, inflaming, it's, it's partly inflaming the situation. So is it a mistake to get the stars get, don't like it. Is it a mistake to get better then? I mean, is there they something about- choice. The world's changed. The problem is now the fans can not only see in real time that a mistake might have been made, they can see for sure on the jumbotron that a mistake was made or, or might have been made. And they can then, and they can capture it on their phones and they can tweet it and they, 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 have, a, they have material for outrage. Mm-hmm. And it's the, the, not just the fans, the players. And so the, the sense of grievance, even though the reason for grievance is clearly declining, the reasons for grievance are cle- is clearly declining, um, the feelings of grievance are going through the roof. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's becoming more fair on a basketball court, but people feel it's less fair. Yeah. And I, but I don't think you could fix it by making the referees even worse than they are. Well, there used to be, you know, remember the phrase that was common in basketball, the makeup call. Yeah, that's a baloney. Like, it, it, is, you know, you, that it presumes you know you made a mistake. And if you know you made a mistake, then don't make it. Uh, no, 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 no. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. The notion of the makeup call was to address precisely the problem you're talking about. That other, everybody's, that some team is outraged. And then, so the reason that you don't get quite as outraged as you, I'm talking about in the past, yeah. in the old system. Is you, no, think, you think that it's is, gonna... is you think, you know the ref is a human being and you say, oh, he'll understand that he blew that call and he'll make it up for me in some subtle way. And that will, so that diminishes my sense of outrage. In a perfect world where these guys are like robots and making the right, which is generally what speaking, increasingly the right are. They're, it's amazing how good they are now. So when they, on those rare occasions when they do make a mistake, there's no expectation of a makeup call. No, that's right. So is that, I mean, there are, I mean, I, because I wonder about the, I agree with you, you can never go back. But I feel like when you sort of roboticize refereeing in sports, what you've done is you've disrupted the narrative of the sport, that you're drawn to the sports because it's a story. And stories, it used to be that the blown calls were part of the narrative. Not a good part of the narrative. Sure, they're yeah. part of like what makes the get, if the game just went smoothly from beginning to end. You, or you, you don't want referee error. It's not a positive thing to have referee error. It's, you want to minimize it. It, it, it you're, you can still have a glorious narrative on a, in, a, in, in any kind of contest sure. without a referee. I yes. think the messiness of the sport is one of the things that- You think, you think the it. more referee error, the better? No, no. I'm saying that, there, that we operated for many years around uh, a narrative about sports right. that included the notion of referee error. We've taken that out, and what we've done is we've disrupted the narrative. Maybe we're just going through a period of time where we're readjusting. I think that's right. The new, I think that's true. I think that's is. partly true. And it, but it's also, I mean, it, you know, it, it, there's a whole bunch of things going on at once. One is that everybody can see the era and replay it and focus on it and organize around it in ways they 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 couldn't before. Another is that the nature of the improvement of the refereeing is it's removing privilege from people who can naturally protest the loudest, the stars. And and they're used to getting the calls and they're not they can't get the calls in the same way. It's also, uh, you know, there was if you go back. Uh, 10 years in the NBA, home court advantage was a much bigger deal. And it was, and there were studies that were done that showed the, the source of home court advantage was referee error. It was like the referees trying to tilt towards a home crowd just to appease them. Now, now it's not that big a deal, but who's pissed about that? The people who are in the arena, the people who think they should get an advantage because it's their home court. Um, but I think against the, the, even bigger than this is the, there's a, the backdrop to all of this is people are more and more aware or have a greater and greater sense that there's no such thing as neutrality, that there's like people are biased. 
you, we are, we, you know, that, that's even a, though in the case of referees, the opposite is true. They are now less biased. They are less. They're even though they're they're and they are they've been made aware of their biases every which way and try to work against them. Um, everybody, it's in the air that a, a, you know a white guy won't be fair as fair to a black guy as he is to a white guy. It's mm-hmm. in the air that that the Kahneman Tversky stuff that that people make those kind of mistakes. It's in the air that they are they favor the home home team or they favor stars. So that there's a even as there's a less reason for cynicism about what's going on inside the mind of a professional NBA referee. There's more awareness awareness of the reasons for cynicism about people's judgment, referee judgment generally. Yeah. That yeah. I mean, one of the takeaways from the common Tversky stuff is that nobody's like nobody's judgments. You know, everybody's judgments is is systematically flawed. It, it, what's interesting is the yes, it is the process of investigating. What the process of investigating bias does is, more than anything, alert us to the uncomfortable fact that there was a lot of bias there that we didn't even think about. That's right. We, were, right. we had no idea just how unfair it all used to be. I, I was at, this reminds me, yesterday I was, for one of my podcast episodes, I'm hanging out with the folks who make the LSAT, who construct the LSAT. Ooh. And they do these bias tests. So they have practice questions, which you all take when you take the LSAT. There's one set, but it's all practice questions. And they look to see whether different groups have different patterns of answering questions correctly, which is something I would never have thought about. So there was a question they showed me, and it's just this random question about some literary figure in the 17th century. And C, which is the wrong answer, all the smartest women taking the test thought was the correct answer. Like 50% of them got it, said it was C, and it wasn't C. D, which is the right answer, was overwhelmingly the male choice. 50% 50% of the men. So here's a question that has... So there's, that, there's patterns in the errors in the errors. There's, com- there's a massive pattern in the error. And there's nothing obvious so they, about... If they, and if they find the pattern in the error, do they think there's something wrong with the question? They throw the question out. And I yeah. said to them, well, what is it about this totally anodyne question about 17th century literature that caused all these really smart female test takers to answer C? Right. And they were like, oh, no idea. <laughs> I thought it was just, <laughs> no clue it just doesn't work yeah. but like that process yeah. the minute I hear that I think oh my god this thing is rigged in ways I hadn't even thought right, right? Yeah. so like it's the same process the same now process. I'm alert before I was like well it's an intelligence test so you know you, you and I have both made this turn into this new medium you're a few, a few years ahead of me how have you found what, what do you find the differences are from writing this prose on the page well, uh, it's funny. I've gone in the opposite. Because I don't write books that are character-driven as much, uh, now in this medium, I'm really into the character-driven. Um, so I like, I'm drawn to the fact that I can bring these characters to life in a way. Because I'm not as, ki- I, don't, I, I don't, I, you know, I'm not being falsely modest. I'm not nearly as good as you at bringing individuals to life on the page. But if I can get tape, then I can do that. I feel I can, like I, you know, and you can capture interactions. Like there's in one of my episodes this for next season, I have these two women who are sisters who wrote a book together, a really good work of history, largely so they could hang out with each other. This one has been, one is like 70, one is 65. And they're so insanely charming. And all you do is just run the tape. And you're in love with it. Well, you're in love with them. It doesn't matter what happens next. It is, a, like, it is amazing the difference when you can hear a person's voice. Yeah. That we, we have an episode, the second episode, which you actually edited. Um, it's about how hard it is to create a referee even when you clearly need a referee. And this is, it's about the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. But we have a woman who is, who is just crushed by student Oh my God, that woman and, broke my and heart. And to the point where she's a, she's a, she is a public school teacher who, with, a, with a couple of little kids who, um, whose student loan servicer has basically deceived her from, from even knowing really about. For years. For years, knowing about a program that Congress created to relieve her student loan debt because it paid them to keep her in the, student, in the, in the debt. And to the point where her, she grind, has been grinding her teeth so badly at night that five of her teeth have fallen out and she now won't smile. And if, if I told the story, just, if I just told the story, you, you might think I had my thumb on the scale. You wouldn't quite believe it. Like you, you'd think I was exaggerating, yeah. but when she just tells it straight, you're weeping. 
I mean, and, and there's no question, the sincerity just, just, it just jumps out of the, off, off the tape in a way, in a way that I would have to try to persuade the reader of. Uh, and I don't, I just, you just let her speak and it's magnificent incredibly moving what can't you do in the podcast form so talk about that story did you whether there, there must be limitations because i can't I do little... things you don't have tape of that's the that's the problem you got to go out and interview you have to have the thing if if it's you just talking it's far less less persuasive than if you've got some someone else you you, you know it's it's um so that it's it's a constraint that's worse with TV when you have to have that the pictures, mm -hmm. I mean, but you can only do so much with your own words in this in the narrative form I think, um, so that's your constraint there. Uh, um, but what can't you do? Like what stories it, when it gets complicated? Yes, it gets hard. The... It, I could not. So it's hard, it was hard, very hard to explain. I didn't even really explain, but I tried to explain a collateralized debt obligation in the big short. It's the most complicated thing I've ever tried to explain to anybody. And, uh, couldn't and do that. That's not possible in a podcast. You could not do it in a podcast. Yeah. Uh, you, you just, you just couldn't. I mean, you, people would have collision. The people listening as they're driving would be having crashes on the highway. And you, you, <laughs> you, um, so the, because the, the reader can go back or the reader can slow down. The reader yeah. can the reader can can pace themselves through an explanation. Um, what always breaks my heart is where you finally find the person who you think can explain the thing and is going to give you tape, and then they're boring. <laughs> Which in a book it doesn't matter, right? In a book, like I feel like what your, a, is, one of your geniuses is, as a writer is you have clearly in your life made lots of boring people seem really fascinating. <laughs> but so I put it a different way. Cheat. So I'd put it a different way. You're absolutely right that, that people's voices kill them as characters. Mm -hmm. um, that you, you, that you're, you're, you're talking to them for five minutes and you think that voice just won't work. It's not working. It's not going to work. Yeah. You know, it, 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 there are people in this world who, I mean, it's, an ama it's almost a superpower, who have an ability to walk into a room and kill all interest in the room. I mean, that I, I, had, I, had, I had an uncle who had this capacity and it was, he was a great guy and he did really interesting stuff. But the minute he opened his mouth, it was like, it was like everybody's gasping for air. There's no oxygen in the yeah. room. And, and he was just incredibly dull. And it was dull list listening to him. And you were just relieved when he, someone, else, someone else threw themselves on that hand grenade. And, and, and he, the, the, so it is true that you can take that person in print and bring them to life. Yeah, I could make my uncle really great in yes. print, but yes. but I I could not. The minute the minute someone heard him speak, you'd lose. Yeah, they wouldn't believe anything you said about him. You know that. what? I the one trick that I found though is sometimes you think someone's going to be boring, but it's because you're in book interview mode, and podcast interview mode is quite different. That what you really want to do when you're interviewing someone on a podcast is you want them to speculate and free associate. So you want to push them. You don't want them giving when you're doing when you're doing the book interview. You want them to describe in detail, you know, A to Z how this works. Yes. Do, 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 walk me through. You always use that. Walk me through how yep. this works. You never say walk me through in the podcast interview. What you say is, what about like imagine this. And then they, at a certain point, they kind of get it. They realize that, oh, we're just like... It's play. It's play. Right. Yeah. No, that's really true. That's um, really true. That, there's a, there was, I had this once with this love... I did this interview for this, one of my podcasts with this guy who was a OBGYN researcher in Philadelphia. And he gets... He's in the weeds on some new kind of contraceptive. Deep in the weeds. And I realize none of this is usable. There's, he starts talking about the endometrium. The endometrium is not working in podcast form. <laughs> And, you know, follicles. And then he sort of says something, and I was like, wait a minute, this thing you're talking about, why is that a contraceptive? He goes, oh, it's not a contraceptive. And he goes on this long, insanely interesting, totally hypothetical thing about, oh, I wouldn't call it a contraceptive. I'd call it something else. And he gives you this long riff about how it's actually this other thing over here. And, like, it's just he just came alive so, because he was... So this is absolutely right. And, and we have, and episode three is about refs, in, 
in, in the culture, like language refs, people, pe- people who, write, who are usage panel members and dictionaries, who yeah. they've all been let go. And the, the people who used to write kind of usage manuals. And I was, ta- we were, I was talking to a guy named Brian Garner, who's one of the characters in the, in the episode. Uh, and he's, he's the author of a book called uh, Garner's Modern English Usage. I think that's what it's called. It's 1,200 pages. It's actually riveting, but nobody, but at Barnes & Noble told him a decade ago it's a defunct category. Yeah. All, all of his heroes, their books sold millions of copies. There were times where, there was a time when, when the language ref occupied a, occupied a bigger role than he does yeah. now. now. Now the crowd refs the language, you know, and, and nobody wants to hear from the snoot. Um, but he's a great snoot. And he, he was just ta- talking about like where the culture has gone and how he's daily outraged by things uh, that he just can't believe that we're, we're, we're becoming this. And he said, I got a letter from my bank that said, dear Mr. Garner, semicolon. <laughs> and he was off for like, 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 for like 10 minutes on on, I, I called my bank manager. I said, there's a mistake. You, it says, dear Mr. Garner, semicolon. Yeah. And, and he says, it's either a colon or a comma. And the bank manager said, um, could you write us a letter about that? Yeah. And he said, so I wrote them a letter. And of course I, he did. You've come to the right place. Yes. I, I wrote, wrote the, I said, I wrote them a letter and I cited all the authorities, including Garner's modern English usage about where the, you don't put a semicolon after dear Mr. Garner. And they, they, they wrote him back and said, um, we're keeping the semicolon. And, and, and he called him, he said, how, 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 and, he's, and now he's just off. He, I, could not, I didn't need to be there anymore, right? He's, yeah. just, he's like in his own world. This is an outrage. Uh, and he's, for him, it's genocide. I mean, yeah. that's, that's, is it that, he's a code red. There's a, there's a certain uh, quality of delight that, that's, that's what we're talking about. That only it's conversational delight. You don't you don't get. It's really hard to get delight off the page. You get delight when you're in a conversation with someone and they go on some in some unexpected direction and you sort of understand that something fabulous is coming down the pike. Yeah. You're kind of waiting for it yeah. and they sort of take on. That's what you're. Yeah. And I those I was trying to prod people a little bit in the direction of going off just to see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> and the good ones will like understand that they've been given license. But they're playing a game with you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Stay with us for some more conversational delight with Malcolm Gladwell. One of the most important things we do for our health every day is brushing our teeth. And yet most of us don't do it properly. Quip is a better electric toothbrush created by dentists and designers. Quip was designed to make brushing your teeth more simple, affordable, and even enjoyable. People, when they brush their teeth, they brush too hard, and and some of those electric toothbrushes, they're just a little too abrasive. Quip is gentle enough on your sensitive gums. It leaves it tingling. It leaves you feeling like, I could brush my teeth forever. You're probably thinking, this toothbrush, like, there's got to be a catch. Probably some clunky charger that I need to plug in to keep it going. No, it doesn't require a clunky charger. It runs for three months on a single charge. Quip is one of the first electric toothbrushes accepted by the American Dental Association. You know why I love Quip, but it's also backed by 20,000 dental professionals. Quip starts at just $25, and if you go to getquip.com rules right now, you get your first refill pack for free with a Quip electric toothbrush. That's your first refill pack for free at G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash rules. Drilled is an investigative true crime style podcast about climate change that Esquire recently called one of the 20 best true crime pods and The New Yorker called a must listen. The first season tells the story of how fossil fuel companies created climate denial and made it go viral. It includes more primary sources than any previous reporting on the subject, and it unearths new internal documents revealing oil companies' strategies. Season two builds off season one with a human scale story about how all of this has impacted one community, 
West Coast crab fishermen. They just became the first industry to sue big oil for its role in contributing to and covering up climate change. Find Drilled wherever you get your podcasts. We're back with more of me and Malcolm Gladwell in conversation at the 92nd Street Y. His new company, Pushkin Industries, is the production house behind Against the Rules. And I couldn't help but tease him a little bit about something the crew there told me. It's funny that the producers, when they came to me in the first place, they said, please, please don't be like Malcolm and, and try to tape your own stuff. The first season almost of Malcolm's podcast almost killed us. That is such nonsense. <laughs> there, you know what they are? I know they're out there. They're like, <laughs> they're these, they're purists, right? They, they're, they come from NPR, which is like the cathedral on the hill. Of sound. Yeah, it's yes. like the Gothic cathedral where, and they sit and they study their scripture and then they go into the cloisters and they take a vow of silence and then they listen to pure audio, you know, in the evenings. Like, that's not the real world I'm living in. I'm not, I'm not in the monastery. No, no, I'm, no, no. So, I don't listen to them. <laughs> and they don't listen to you. <laughs> Wait, um, so we have questions. We have questions. Um, we actually, we have quite a lot of time. Um, <clears throat> but I had some other... Um... Oh, I wanted to talk to you about uh, falling in love. Um, it's, we talked about this a little bit. I want you to talk a little more, more about this. Because you're in your fiction, in your nonfiction, in your books you fall in love with characters. And then you were saying that in the podcast, you're doing a different kind of, slightly different storytelling where you're having many voices. Does that impair your, are we gonna get the classic Michael Lewis character who we fall in love along with you? And if we're not, does that sort of, are you a little bit sad about not having people to fall in love with? You, you have people to fall in love with. It's just they're, ep, they're, they're in a single episode. I just don't live with them for the whole series. Yeah. I fell in love with Alex Kogan. Alex Kogan is, he was the, the academic responsible for the work that supposedly allowed Cambridge Analytica to get Donald Trump elected. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, it's all bullshit. Uh, and the, his work was useless. Uh, the the this, this real story there is that it's amazing that Cambridge Analytica persuaded anybody they knew anything that was useful. Uh, it's a hustle. It's a hustle. It's a hustle. Right. A hustle. right. Yes. And every, yeah. a lot of people wanted to believe that that's why Donald Trump was elected because they needed a reason why Donald Wait, Trump Wait, what episode is this? This is three. This is actually part of th episode three. So Which is, what's, the, what's the larger story? The largest story is the decline of, of kind of these culture refs. And so it's, it's language refs. It's ombudsman, it's referees in the newsroom. So how this story ever got to the front page of the New York Times is, is, is part of it. But, but he's built up as the main character of the thing. And in a very similar way to a character that you would fall in love with in a magazine piece. Yeah. Um, so this is totally, the, you, in some ways, it's, it's, as, it's easier to sell the characters because you can hear them. You can see why you 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 should fall in love with him. Um, you, have, you have Ken Feinberg, don't you, showing up? How many people here, uh, I, you can't really see it, but I wonder how many people here even know who Ken Feinberg is. Uh, Ken, Ken Feinberg should be a household name. Ken Feinberg was uh, an ordinary lawyer when he was brought in in the early 80s to try to resolve the dispute between Vietnam veterans and the chemical companies that made Agent Orange. And Vietnam veterans, had, without a whole lot of evidence, uh, had, had brought a suit saying that, that this, this chemical that was sprayed across the jungles of, Viet, of Vietnam was responsible for all these health problems that they were having. And the case had lingered in the courts for, I don't know, seven or eight years. And judges had despaired of resolving it. Um, and a judge asked this young lawyer, Ken Feinberg, to see if he could negotiate outside of the court uh, uh, a, 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 a solution, a resolution to the, to, between the vets and the co companies. And in six weeks, he had the thing done. And he was on the front page of every newspaper in the country. And his career then just went, mm. he, he, all of a sudden, he became America's referee. Uh, so he's, he's brought in to adjudicate these disputes. And um, the question was, 
like two questions. Like, what are we going to do when he dies? Because he seems to be brought in. I mean, he's like, he's like the Forrest Gump of, 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 of American tragedy. And, and, but the second is like, what, what, what is it about him? Like, and I don't want to give away the story, but he, there were, he had a theory of himself and his wife had a different theory of him and the wife's was right. Uh, but, but, but you, but his theory of his wife's theory, you can hear kind of proven just yeah. in the sound of his voice. Oh, his voice uh, it, is fan. It's unbelievable. So, so the, the, it's so good that. Uh, I think it's all the voice. So it's so, it's so, it could be the voice. It's part, it's, it's the righteousness in the voice. It's the, it, the, it's the, and it's a Boston accent. Like you cannot believe. And so the, the episode opens with the passage um, in the Bible, uh, the, Solomon resolving the dispute uh, between the two women, each of whom is claiming the baby is hers. And he's, Solomon just cut, about to cut the baby in two. And um, Feinberg's voice is so, we were going to have an actor read that. We had, the Feinberg's voice was so good, we just had Feinberg read the Bible. And it, was like, it felt like God was reading the Bible. <laughs> Uh, and, and so you, the, the, it's, it's a, so this form, you know, yeah. this form, it's just nice to have a different way to tell a story and a different way to get to an audience. I, I don't, I don't regard this as like a substitute for writing books, but it is, it's different and it's interesting. Yeah. I don't know what you felt when you write it, no matter how conversational your writing style is, it is not conversational that how people talk is so different from how any writer writes that you have to learn how to write your, your own dialogue. That in itself is kind of interesting. Yeah. Anyway, thanks for doing this. Michael, thank you. Pleasure thank being you with so you much. again. Yes. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this live bonus episode of Against the Rules. I want to thank especially Malcolm Gladwell and his team at Pushkin Industries and the 92nd Street Y for hosting our conversation. I'm off now to my secret hiding place. We'll try to figure out how to keep you entertained next year. You can follow Pushkin Pods on social media if you want to keep track of when I'm back on the feed. I hope it's soon. I don't know each and every one of you, but you've been a great audience, the best a writer could ask for. 